Well, this morning I want to talk to you about Rise of the Prayer Warriors. You know, if we want to accomplish anything in God, first of all, the foundation of prayer must be laid. And I love what George Whitfield said, a Gloucester man, one of the greatest evangelists this world's ever produced, and he came from our very own city. George Whitfield said this, I go to bed at 10 p.m. so that I can get up at 4 a.m. so I can pray. George Whitfield was serious about prayer, and because of that, the Great Awakening happened, and literally tens of thousands of people came to Christ. John Wesley said that I never spend any less than two hours a day in prayer. Smith Wigglesworth, the famed healing evangelist, said, I never pray any more than 15 minutes, but I never go more than 15 minutes without praying. Martin Luther also prayed two hours a day. William Wilberforce prayed more than three hours every single day. And William Temple said, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't pray, they don't happen. Prayer is so powerful. And the Bible is a book that is um, predominantly devoted to prayer. It's, It's devoted to mankind's relationship with their creator. And this relationship is often founded upon communication. And communication with God is simply prayer. You see, we don't have to get all religious about prayer. And there are many people in the church today that sadly get religious about prayer. They they say maybe the, the, the Lord's Prayer every single day. We know what that prayer is, don't we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as in. Give us today our, and forgive us our, oh, trespasses. Oh, good King James English. <laughs> give us our trespasses as we forgive those who, amen. Well, this prayer is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our day, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And unfortunately, there are many believers out there who, when they pray, all they really do is just repeat this prayer But Jesus didn't create this prayer for it to be repeated. Did you know that? The disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray, not teach us what to pray. He said, how? How should we pray? And so Jesus gave them this model as an example of how they should pray. And, you know, if you want evidence that we really shouldn't be praying this prayer off pat, I want you to go home and do a study this week on the four Gospels and the entire New Testament. And if you can find me anywhere else that anybody ever prayed this prayer, I will say, well, it's okay to pray on a daily basis. Because the fact of the matter is, it's only on this occasion that Jesus prayed this prayer. If you look at all of the other prayers of Jesus, Jesus never once prayed like this. And if you look at all of the prayers in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, None of the apostles or disciples prayed like this. This was not supposed to be a prayer that we repeat off pat day after day. This was a model to us, explaining to us the content of what our prayer life should be. And there are pretty much seven things. I love the number seven, don't you? Jesus often uses sevens, doesn't he? There are seven things in this prayer that we should consider. The first thing is the direction of prayer. Now, I know many people pray to Jesus, and I'm not saying that's, that's wrong, but really, in the New Testament, we are commanded by Jesus not to pray to him, but to direct our prayers to the Father. You see, we pray in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, and he's our mediator between God and man, and he's our high priest. And so we pray through him and through the name and the power and authority of the person of Jesus Christ, but we don't pray to Jesus We pray to the Father. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. We can talk to the Holy Spirit, but we don't necessarily present our requests to the Holy Spirit. We pray to the Father. You see, the Holy Spirit didn't come to draw attention to himself. The Holy Spirit came to draw attention to Christ. And Christ didn't come to draw attention to himself. Christ came to draw attention to the Father. And so our prayer life should be empowered by the Spirit in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. 
but should always be directed to the Father who lives in unapproachable light, who is unseen, whom no man has ever seen, and no man will see. The second thing we should pray is for the sanctification of the name of God. The name of God is so holy, so pure, that we must never misuse it. As Christians, we must never go around saying, oh my God this or OMG that. We must never misuse the name of the Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ. The name of God must be sanctified. It must be held in the highest regard and the highest esteem. It must be set apart for holy mention only. Even the Jewish people wouldn't mention God's name. Instead, they would replace it with Hashem, which in Hebrew means the name. The holy sanctified name. So we must be very careful to use God's name in a proper context. The third thing is that we should pray for the kingdom arrival on earth. And the kingdom's arrival in this time is simply God's will being done in the lives of believers. We know there's a physical kingdom coming when Jesus returns, don't we? And that kingdom is going to be established for a thousand years on earth. But we pray both for the second coming of Jesus Christ, but in the meantime we pray for God's rule and will to be done in the hearts of men and women. The the fourth thing we pray for are daily necessities, for food, for clothing, for water, for shelter, the things we need to survive and the things we need to live. The fifth thing we need to pray for is forgiveness of our own personal sin. Because even though positionally we are the righteousness of Christ, our flesh hasn't realized it yet. Our flesh still likes to sin from time to time. And even our fallen mind that needs to be renewed on a daily basis often wanders off in a thought process that shall we say is rather sometimes not too godly so we need to ask God for forgiveness of sin on a daily basis as we forgive others which is point number six to forgive other people of their sin is to be in right relationship with them and the seventh and final thing is protection from evil protection from sin Protection from the evil one, Satan. And as this word actually means, protection from all harm that can come to us. We need to pray for God's protection in our life. And there's this great guy in the Bible called Elijah. Who's ever heard of Elijah before? Elijah was this awesome prophet of God. And if anybody in the scriptures knew how to pray and get answers, it was Elijah. And there's this amazing scripture in 1 Kings chapter 17. And it reads like this, verse 1. Now Elijah, the Tishbite, how many of you know what a Tishbite is? Neither do I. (laughs) Now Elijah, the Tishbite, sounds like a disease, doesn't it? From Tishbe in Gilead said to King Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. Do you serve the Lord God of Israel this morning? Amen. There will be neither Jew nor nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Wow. Now in England, we often pray to God, don't we? God, we don't want there to be any more dew or rain for the next few years, especially during the summertime. Because in England, one thing we are blessed with is an abundance of rain. And that's why our land is so green and healthy and we've got so much produce in this country. But in a place like Israel or in the Middle East, they get rain basically two times a year, springtime and kind of autumn time. And if they don't get those rains, then the the ground won't be soft enough to receive the seed and the latter rains won't produce the fruit and the full kind of uh, grain that they need to survive. And so literally in Israel, if there's no rain, they have no food. And if there's no food, they have no life. And so when Elijah here is saying to King Ahab, due to my word, there's going to be no longer any rain. What Elijah is pronouncing upon Israel is a death sentence. It's not just kind of like, well, there's not going to be no more rain. They're like, oh, well, that's a shame, but let's kind of get on with our lives anyway. There's no more getting on with your life. No rain, no food, no life. And so God, through Elijah here, is pronouncing a death sentence upon that country in order that 
they will become afraid. In order that they will turn away from these false gods of Baal and Asherah and turn to the one true God of Israel. You see, Israel had backslidden. They had started to worship foreign gods. And so God sent Elijah to humble them, to drive them to their knees in desperation so that they would realize that Baal and Asherah are not even gods at all. They're just man-made objects. And that there is only one God who controls the weather patterns and the weather systems on planet Earth. And he is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We turn to the book of James. I love the book of James because James was the brother of Jesus Christ. And James, of all of the apostles, spent more time with Jesus than anybody. He was literally raised with Jesus and possibly by Jesus when Joseph died. And so James had intimate knowledge of Jesus. He had spent every day of his life with him, sat at the dinner table with him, had conversations about God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine for the first 30 years of your life being in the same house as Jesus Christ and being able to ask him anything you want? How awesome would that be? Well, James had that privilege and James says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Because some of our bodily sicknesses, it comes from our sin. And if we confess our sin, we can be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And Elijah was a human being just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, Elijah prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Now, I want you to notice in the King's passage, there is no mention there that Elijah prayed. He just said at my word, there's going to be no more rain. No mention that Elijah prayed. So how did James know that Elijah had prayed earnestly that it would not rain? He knew because Jesus had told him. Jesus was there in Elijah's day. Jesus spoke with Elijah. Jesus knew the prayer life of Elijah. And the reason the heavens were shut up was not just because God had willed them to be, but because Elijah had recognized that this was perhaps one of the only ways that Israel would turn back to the Lord, their God. You see, Elijah knew how to pray. And Elijah prayed with a heart filled with love for his nation. And sometimes love isn't telling people what they want to hear or doing nice things for people. Sometimes true love is being harsh. Sometimes true love is telling people the truth even when they don't want to hear it. You know, true love isn't turning a blind eye and keeping the peace. True love is often divisive. Remember what Jesus said? I have not come to this earth to bring peace. I have come to this earth to bring division. For members of one family will be against another. Father and son will be divided. And sometimes, as Christians, we have to be harsh in our love. We have to be harsh in our prayer life, as Elijah was, to bring the nation back to God. You see, so long as England and Great Britain continue in their prosperity and in their lawlessness and immorality, it's unlikely they're going to turn back to God. There needs to be a dramatic happening that forces people to their knees in desperation. And sometimes as Christians, we need to pray, God, do whatever it takes to bring my loved one to Christ. Do whatever it takes to bring my neighborhood to Christ. Do whatever it takes to bring this country of yours back to Christ. So why did Elijah pray like this? Well, if you want to be a prayer warrior, one thing is that you have to learn 
is to pray covenantally. Now you might be here this morning, especially you younger ones, you might be, what's a covenant? Well, basically a covenant is an agreement between two or more people. It's a legally binding agreement. It's a promise that you make. You know, the other day I went out and I bought an animation studio for Finney, Bradley and Archie, and it's amazing because you put it onto the computer and they can draw little cartoon characters and make them move and make them talk and do all kinds of things like this. And I went out and I purchased that for them because I thought it'd be amazing for them to learn that sort of stuff so as they grow older, they can start producing all kinds of stuff for the Lord, eh? It'd be amazing. And I bought it for them, I purchased it for them, it was theirs, legally theirs. I had told them it is theirs and I uploaded it to the computer in my office. But the only trouble is the computer in my office is up a ladder, quite a high ladder. And they can only go up that ladder when they get my permission. And so although the promise is up there in my office, they have to come to me and ask permission to go up that ladder. And when I'm standing with them, I supervise them going up that ladder to make sure they're okay. And it's the same thing with a covenant. Sometimes God will covenant something with us, his people, and give us promises. But we have to appropriate them by going to him and asking him to take us up the ladder. Does that make sense? Now in the covenant given to Israel through Moses, God said this. Now listen to this. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 to 18. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain. And the ground will yield no produce. And you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. So fix these words of mine in your hearts and in your minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. This was a promise of God. That if they obeyed him, he would give them all the rain they needed and all the produce. But if they turn to worship other gods, like Baal, like Asherah, then he would shut up the heavens so that they would perish. And Elijah being a man of the covenant, a man who knew the word of God like the back of his hand, he began to pray that very promise into existence. God, you've said in your word you're going to shut up the heavens if they turn to other gods. Now God, they're turning. Now God, they're worshipping these false idols, these statues, these demons. God, you promised, shut the heavens. And I can imagine Elijah, he didn't just pray once like this, but he persisted in prayer. God, shut the heavens. Shut the heavens. You said it in your covenant. Now fulfill it. Shut the heavens. Shut the heavens. The Spirit of God may have whispered to him, at your word, the heavens will now be shut. And from that day onwards, for the next three and a half years, there was no rain in the land of Israel. Elijah knew how to pray. He prayed covenantally. Now, if you want to be a prayer warrior, and I know people in this church you are prayer warriors aren't you but if you want to grow in the grace of prayer if you want to grow as a as somebody who communicates with heaven and sees results you need to now pray covenantally you see it's no good now turning to the law of Moses and looking in there and saying God shut the heavens over Great Britain because the law of Moses no longer exists the entirety of the covenant given to Israel came to an end with the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Jesus fulfilled every jot and every tittle of that covenant. And when he did, the Mosaic covenant was abolished, all 613 commandments. But when Jesus shed his blood, a new covenant was ratified. A new covenant was brought into effect. 
And this is what we call the New Testament, the New Covenant. And it is now as believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ that we should study, not read, not peruse, but study this new covenant. Because it is in this new covenant that God has given the church his great and precious promises. And when we learn these promises and when we pray these promises, God has to deliver not because we demand, but because he is faithful to fulfill every promise he has ever uttered from his lips to us. And the reason we have seen a revival in recent times is because an Irish man called Roy Andrews would turn up at my house every morning at half past six to seven o'clock and he would pray repeatedly over and over again God it says in your word if we draw close to you you will draw close to us you promised never to leave us never to forsake us you promised to give us power and morning after morning Roy and myself would pray fulfill your promise oh God and seven years later we saw what happened didn't we God will always fulfill his promises. Now, he may not fulfill it overnight or that same week or that same month, but you persist, folks. You don't give up on God. Like Jacob, you wrestle with God. Remember, Jacob was wrestling with who? The angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? Jesus. And as Jacob was wrestling with Jesus, this wasn't just a... A sissy kind of Nancy push backwards and forwards. Oh, get off. No, leave me alone. Get off. <coughs> Come on, folks. It was WWE. It was wrestling. It was proper grappling. Headlock stuff. Slamming them to the floor. Proper grabbing old and fighting. Jacob was having a proper fight with Jesus. And it went on all night. How exhausted would you be if you'd been wrestling all night? I don't know about you, I couldn't last more than 20 minutes. But Jacob was going to get his blessing and he was going to wrestle with Jesus until he got it. And in the end, Jesus became so kind of frustrated is the wrong word because Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus wanted to push Jacob to the limit. I'll say that. Jesus wanted to push Jacob to his limits. And Jesus turns around and whacks Jacob's hip, dislocating the entire bone. How many of you would like a prayer life like that? <laughs> Persistent, painful wrestling with Jesus. And there's Jacob's leg hanging off, flopping around in the breeze, hobbling along on his other leg. And Jesus is walking off into the sunset like one of those films. And Jacob says, oh, no, you don't. And he grabs a hold of Jesus' tunic. I ain't letting you go until you bless me. And Jesus turns around with this big, radiant smile on his face and says, well done. You didn't give up through all the pain, through all the struggle, through all the denial. You didn't give up. From now on, your name will no longer be Jacob, Yaakov. It will be Yisrael. For you have wrestled with God himself and you have overcome. Do I see a few Israels in this place today? Will you wrestle with God for the blessing of salvation in this city? Will you wrestle with God for the salvation of this land? For God is not willing that anyone should perish. I heard this story of a young sick girl. She wasn't very well and laid up in bed. And the pastor came around to see and to speak with her. And she confessed to her pastor how disappointed she had been in her young life witnessing to her friends at school. And the pastor turned around and said, well, you can't go out now and witness, but what you can do is to stay in your bedroom and pray for them. And so this little girl made a list of 56 names of people she wanted to come through for Jesus Christ. And every day as she lay there sick in bed, she prayed and prayed and prayed her little heart out that these people would get saved. 
Well, all of a sudden, in this little community in America, a revival broke out. And sure enough, one after another after another of those 56 names was ticked off on a list as they were getting saved. Short while later, that little girl died. She passed away. And on the day of her death, the 56th person came through for Jesus Christ. You see, even in her pain, even in her immobility, she persisted in prayer. Even though she herself was dying and probably racked in agony, she persisted wrestling in prayer. And on the day that her physical body died but her spirit went to glory, I imagine she looked down and saw that last person come to Christ. And what rejoicing there would have been in heaven for that little girl. Amen? Can I encourage you today to become a prayer warrior? to take out a significant chunk of your day and devote it to personal time with God Almighty. For God loves you. His ears are attentive to your prayers. And if you persist in covenantal prayer, God will and God must answer, for he is not a man that he would lie to us.